caviar just came in uh, for today. This is gonna be for the caviar hand roll, which has been kind of a signature dish, something we've you know, definitely been known for for the past few years. Uh, What's the trick to it? Uh, I think a lot of yeah. caviar. I think just, just yeah, a, a lot, lot of, caviar. of caviar. One of the ways that we taste it, of course, is just having a mouthful of it. We're looking at the pearls, we're looking at the shine, the color. Of course, it's beautiful, but then also the flavor is one of the most important things. It's a tough day at the job, man, you know? That'll work. <laughs> Our caviar hand roll has about 30 grams, yeah. 30 plus grams of caviar, of caviar. Um, which is a huge mouthful. So this is a Japanese grain called Suya Hime, uh, coming from Yamagata, Japan, uh, mixing in a little bit of uh, Japanese black vinegar and mirin as well. An ounce of caviar, if you bought it at another restaurant at one of these big caviar houses, it's gonna cost you four to five times what yeah. we sell it for. So we're, we're trying to make it still affordable, still like, an approachable price point. This will last us maybe a day, day and a half, um, but I only bring out you know, a small bowl during service. Uh, so we're doing the caviar hand roll. We'll start with the uh, Japanese nori. This is our sushi rice uh, marinated with the black vinegar, fresh wasabi. And again, to really understand what caviar's flavor profile is, why it's so great in life. And some caviar. And I think the tamaki is one of the best ways to deliver that. When we go to a restaurant, we see a plate that has so many auxiliary ingredients, all these things that accompanies it. I'll cut that dude out. Just give me, just give me the caviar. Just give me caviar, you know? yeah. So right now we're a pretty small team, still trying to look, build up staff. So it's just me and uh, two Alexes, two guys, Alex one, Alex two. Looking for a third Alex if anyone is looking for a job. So this is for the the first dish on the menu, the the breakfast taco. So right now we're peeling the eggs. All right, uh, breakfast taco. Yeah, breakfast taco. We both grew up in Arizona eating those, you know, all the time. Turned into like, what if we you know, what if we did a taco? We have it on a rolling cycle and it needs about two days for like the flavor to really set into the egg. Time-wise, this is definitely one of my bigger projects of the day. So this is like a very non-traditional way of making a uh, Tortillas, per se. So yeah, when we started first, like testing out the the recipes for the taco, uh, you know, we tried making flour tortillas a lot of different ways. Using a pasta machine is not the most traditional method, but it works really well and it works for us. It's super efficient. If it works, it works, whether it's you know traditional or not. We've been cooking in restaurants a long time, you know, doing either other people's food or even at the last place doing Japanese food but we've never really told our story, our, our background, and been able to bring that to, to the menu. Yeah. Flour tortillas. And I think that's why the, uh, the breakfast taco is so important to us. I think it, it kind of offers a little bit of our past. Have the salsa verde on the bottom. Fried hash brown. A little bit of that French technique, a lot of Japanese ingredients with a little bit of Southwest. Yeah. It's also like the high brow, low brow. Like yeah. it's a taco, but it has trout roe. Yeah. Uh, so this is like all the ash from last night. This is the first thing in the morning. Take all the old ash out so we can uh, get the oven clean, ready for today. We've been looking for a restaurant space for uh, a couple years. Started before pandemic, around September last year. We found this space. It used to be a pizza place. Great big wood oven. The oven's still like 550 degrees, just left over from last night, the heat. We'll kind of let this cool down to about 400, 420. Uh, and then we'll bake the bread. Uh, so this is bread flour and rye flour. Before pandemic, I'd never really done any kind of sourdough baking. I had a lot of time to work on it last year. This is a uh, black cocoa powder. This is our seed mixture, so there's pumpkin seeds, sunflower. So we're gonna let this finish kneading the last five minutes and then uh, come back, then we'll add some butter and salt, knead that again, and then we'll start the folding process after that. So this is uh, now the last step of the bread, portioning it out to go into the baskets. Then we'll put this in the fridge, uh, basically let it slow, slow proof overnight. This is uh, the bread that we made yesterday. Now we're gonna bake it in the wood oven. No one like told us that this is the way to do it. It just kind of happened by testing over time. Like we realized that when we came the next day, the oven was still hot and ready to bake. So it was perfect for, for the bread. I asked Sam to get me a headlamp for this, but he said I'd have to wear it all day if he got one. I heard you were talking about a headlamp. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Figure if I can get it out there, you know, <laughs> and get a GoFundMe for my yeah. headlamp. <laughs> this is definitely the first thing we do every day because 
We have to get the uh, fire going in the oven for all the other things we need to do. Some days, like today is a, a good example where we come in and the oven's just way too hot to bake bread every once in a while. So sometimes those days we can get slowed down a little. One of the downsides of using wood fire is uh, you have to use a whole lot of wood. A lot more uh, manual labor than we expected with this. So uh, here we have the Berkshire pork ribs. We brine them for two days and then we take them out and we smoke them in the oven. Berkshire short rib. We originally tried all the proteins, every single thing that we could put in the oven, that we could smoke out to figure out what held up the best. The short rib actually held up the most, brining it for about three days, really increasing the moisture in it, but also changing the textures throughout those times. And then it goes here in the oven. You want to make sure it's really like raging. So this is definitely like one of the, the longest process items we have. You know, we have to start it at least three to four days before we need it for service. It means that come service, uh, it's not going to take too much work. This is when they're done. Uh, so now we're on one of the last steps for the pork short rib. Uh, so it's already been brined, smoked, sous vide, and pressed. Uh, now we're just portioning it for service tonight. Uh, try to get, you know, equal sized pieces for everyone. I think it really just highlights what kind of meat can come out of this kitchen, the way it carries the, the smokiness of the whole kitchen. This is our wood fire grill hearth that we cook a lot of things over. This is a Japanese charcoal grill, so we'll do charcoal on this side, uh, wood fire on this side. During service, we'll put the, the short rib up here. It kind of sits in the smoke all night, uh, kind of just gently warming over the fire. You know, it touches literally every fire source we have. It's smoked in the wood oven, it's smoked on the wood grill, it's seared on the Japanese charcoal. Like, it's, I think it's really like a product of, of the kitchen. Yeah. I've had people from St. Louis, all over the, the East Coast here, say that was some of the best barbecue they had. We're not a barbecue. Yeah, restaurant. I didn't intend it to be a, a nod to American barbecue. Yeah, but, but it just ended up that way. Yeah. So this is a cardamom cake. Uh, this is the base layer of the baked Alaska. Uh, so we wanted to come up with some kind of dessert that basically would highlight the, the wood oven that we're using. One of the mainstays of everyday prep for me is the, the baked Alaska. When we did it in the oven, it got like this almost crispy exterior with the meringue that like you don't usually get just from torching it. In the process of creating the, the cake underneath, having sorbet spun every day, scooping it, refreezing it, making the meringue. So this is a, a lingonberry sorbet that I'm scooping. They'll scoop it on top of the cardamom cake and then put that back in the freezer. And then uh, once that refreezes a little bit, we'll dip it into a, a meringue to create the, the Alaska. You know, you want to kind of scoop fast, but they also have to be all like the same size and look nice. But if you go too slow, then it's going to start to melt before you can get it back in the freezer. So I'm going to start making the uh, soy milk uh, for the tofu dish. So we have uh, soybeans that just soaked in water overnight. We don't work with a lot of like recipes, it's more just kind of you know, low, knowing what to look for and cooking like that. Like the soybean to water ratio, I don't really have an exact measurement. It's just kind of each day we make it, we look for different things of what to improve and how to make it better. So for the tofu dish, uh, you know, we start with just dried soybeans. Uh, we turn that into the soy milk before making the actual tofu itself instead of just buying soy milk somewhere. So you get a much more soy flavor. The soybean mixture just came to a boil. Uh, so now I'll strain it through a chinois. Uh, and then we'll have fresh soy milk. I grew up, and no offense to my parents, I love them, love them to death. My parents used to make tofu once a week, and it was never, never great, I have to say. So this becomes the, the soft tofu uh, that's served with uh, grilled carrots. So these are our um, red dragon carrots. They have this nice purple flesh, and then on the inside they're like either yellow or orange. So the first step to cooking them is uh, we blanch them. Once they come out and cool, you can see on the inside, each one's different as well. Like if you see this one, that one's the same, of course. <laughs> you cut that. Of course, all of them are the same. Now. Yeah, there you go. So from here, we're going to um, chop them up and uh, mix them with a little bit of uh, garlic oil, and we're going to cook them over the Japanese grill. He only put like six logs in there, but you get this thing really going, and it, like sparks up and everything. Kind of cool. I came into work one time and Sam's just like, here, come here, try this real quick. And put a spoon in my mouth and it was fresh tofu. So this is uh, plating the tofu course. Uh, so these are the grilled carrots tossed in a sobacha sesame dressing. I was really blown away by the textures, the flavor of it. Uh, this is the set tofu. 
So I'm always impressed that he, you can actually make tofu better than my parents can. So, sorry mom. Potato course kind of came about a few weeks ago. Looking for a new dish to put on the menu. Me and the two Alexes, we found these like amazing potatoes that are just like naturally super creamy, super flavorful. And like, what can we do to build a dish around this potato and highlight that? And that kind of took like more of a, I don't like to say like a, a clam chowder route. For this dish, we actually um, warm the potato up in the oven right before we um, do it. And the eel is also smoked. This is the smoked eel that goes on top of the potato dish. I've used American Unagi in the past. We tried getting some of the eels from them and smoking them in-house. Uh, and it came out, you know, pretty good. We're happy with it. Um, but we tried the, the product that they smoked. And honestly, it just, it's better. You know, having that smoked unagi on the bottom side is having like the best kind of bacon. All right, so now we're gonna confit the uh, Prince of Orange potatoes. Basically, you just cook it till it's done. I feel like it's hard to be impressed just by like a pure potato, um, but these are just so creamy and have an amazing texture just uh, naturally. So already on the bottom of the plate is the, the smoked unagi. Uh, and then we have the Prince of Orange potato, fresh cracked black pepper. Uh, this is a aioli made with uh, paprika and mussels. On top is some uh, sorrel. And so when Sam's talking about, oh yeah, this is uh, somewhat like a chowder in a sense. And then a table side sauce poured of the potato skin and mussel broth. A lot of our guests walk away feeling that, you know, it's rich, it's homey, it's familiar in a sense, but maybe you haven't had it uh, composed just quite like that. I think it's been a hit so far. Uh, so it's about two o'clock in the afternoon now, kind of making our way through the prep list for the day. Still waiting on salmon to come in. It's one of those things like, you hope it's gonna come in time. If not, like, are we gonna have salmon on the menu tonight? We'll, we'll see. Don't really have a backup, so kind of at the mercy of uh, the drivers today. Uh, so this is the, the Swiss meringue for the baked Alaskas. So like a lot of our days, you know, having uh, a set schedule of when things need to get done by, um, like making the baked Alaskas. If I scoop the sorbet, and later in the afternoon, there's not enough time to get ice cream refros and finish the Alaskas, um, things like that. So now the, the meringue is pretty nice stiff peaks. So we'll take the scooped sorbet, kind of dip it all around. Nice little. So working here with the, only have the wood fire, um, like we don't have any gas stove, it's just all wood fire. It's actually nice to kind of have that kind of constraint. I think it actually helps boost creativity when you have, you know, guidelines that you have to work within. So we try to have every dish have either some smoke element or touches the wood fire, at least in some way. So then we'll hold these again in the freezer. All right, Sam, just came through the doors here for you. Finally. So it's about 3.30 now, uh, only a couple hours full services came in pretty late today. Uh, so we got to move pretty quick to get it turned around. So a lot of my experience uh, working in restaurants in the past has been working with um, mostly Japanese fish and products. It's been a great exposure for me to really learn how to take care of fish. We're building out the menu, wanted to have some kind of like raw crude, of course. It just felt natural to want to highlight fish, raw fish, and have our take on that. Yeah, so this is uh, definitely one of the things that you know I've done, broken down you know, hundreds or thousands of fish uh, over the past 15 years. It's kind of second nature now, just do what needs to be done, do it quickly, do it nicely. So now the salmon's broken down, uh, slicing it for dinner service tonight. On the first glance of our menu, you see a lot of Japanese inspiration, you see a lot of uh, Japanese techniques, of course. Uh, so this is our king salmon, brushed with a little bit of fresh ponzu. But I think overall, when I look at a dish like that, there's salmon, there's apple, there's tarragon. I really think New York. This is our uh, smoked apple vinaigrette. When people ask us about what type of food are you, you know, we kind of fall back on saying like modern American or new American. Uh, but I think overall, it is very much a New York style menu. Gravlax and apples is, is New York City. So it's 5.30, we're just cleaning up. We open at six, we're just getting the restaurant. It's a tip-top, beautiful condition. Alex number two is uh, frying his potatoes. 2.0 is frying his uh, hash browns for the breakfast taco, and Sam is building the fire over here. So it's six o'clock right now. Uh, service is starting, people are coming in to sit down. Uh, we're gonna start getting the first orders within the next couple minutes, and probably Pretty busy within about 30 minutes from now. All right, four crudo. One crudo. Two more crudo. Six. People definitely try to like pinhole like what 
our food is, what it, yeah. like, it's called this, no, it's this, and like, it's just our food. Like, yeah. this is just what we want to do. Yeah. <laughs> like, There's all things from all over the world, all over the country. Um, and for me, that's very New York, you know? This is the most diverse city I've ever lived in or ever got to experience. Uh, hand rolls on six. Two potato walking in, five tacos walking in. One of our chefs is out on the floor. I'll be happy to take over Expo a little bit, get back into the kitchen. It's really nice that we can all take turns. Everyone should know every job here. We've worked in some really amazing restaurants in our lives. I think what we're trying to do here is a little bit different. We don't want to be a $150 price point, a $200 price point, to force you to get all the ingredients that you might not love. Yeah. You don't have to spend a lot of money to have a great time to go yeah. eat at dinner. But bringing the same level of like attention to details and service that we would bring it at a higher price point. All right, two squash. When you look at it, again, it's not just Japanese, it's not just French, it's not just uh, Nordic or American. Being where we're at now, I'm happy that Sam as a chef, as a cook in life, can actually explore any type of food that he, you want to. Because, you know, you're not, you're not pigeonholed in doing, oh, this is just Japanese, or this is just French. You can do whatever you want here. We're always exploring more, we're always learning more as a team. But then our guests get to come back so often and see that we're creating yeah. newer dishes, newer ideas. Yeah. Of, of if you come back are. six weeks later, you're gonna get probably a mostly new menu. Yeah. Because um, we're always just looking for changes and keeping it seasonal, and we get bored of doing the same thing, so yeah. change it up. Well, on table three myself, you know, we've known each other for 15 years, but working together 14 of those years, you know, I moved out to, to New York to actually go work yeah. with him. It's always happy to have uh, someone like Sam around me, you know, always uplifted me, always wanted me to be the best I could be, and always had my back throughout everything. All right, going to table 11, and I thought that was really important, especially opening a new business together, yeah. or a restaurant together, you know, we always we always had each other's backs. Yeah. You, need, you need to work with people you trust. Uh, and no, and there's no one I know or trust more than Ray. Dude, he's my best friend. Fire for Alaska. Getting to come to work every day, working with people I love in life and care about is all I'm looking for. This is our wood-fired baked Alaska. Uh, looks very simple from the outside. As you kind of tap through the meringue, see the inside. Thank you, sir.